Four Years of Fury. The Civil War was the seminal event in the lives of a generation. It forever changed American culture, politics, and families. What remains of the War of the Rebellion today, a century and a half later, are aging artifacts, sputtering newsreels, torn photographs, dog-eared clippings, and these. Markers and monuments, reminders of individuals who thought it was important to fight for something they believed in. The outbreak of war in 1861 thrust them into an unwanted limelight. It interrupted their lives, separated them from home and loved ones, and pushed them into harm's way. It killed or maimed a generation of young men, north and south. All told, more than 600,000 soldiers died in the war. Tens of thousands of others were wounded and carried those scars and handicaps into their civilian lives. In rural Portage County, Ohio, more than 2,000 men fought in the war, some for three months, some for more than three years. They often called themselves the Soldier Boys, and this is their story, the Soldier Boys of Portage County. Portage County was caught out of the old Connecticut Western Reserve. It was typical of many other counties in northeastern Ohio and western Pennsylvania. The economy was dominated by agriculture, cattle, sheep, hogs, cheese, corn, and maple syrup. The Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal and the Cleveland and Pittsburgh Railroad provided transportation to people and freight before the war. Small villages, some mere crossroads, dotted the landscape. Ravenna Township, home of the county seat, had the largest population, about 1,800 people. Randolph in the south was a thriving community of almost equal size. A nearby rival to Ravenna was the growing village of Franklin Mills, later renamed Kent. Politically, as the war approached, the county leaned toward the Republican Party and its new leader. Abraham Lincoln enjoyed success in Portage County. And uh, when he ran for election, of course, in 1860, uh, Portage County went for him. He rewarded Portage County in a strange way. When he was en route to Washington for his first inauguration, he stopped in Ravenna and picked up a few of his political friends, and they went with him to Washington. Of the 24,000 people in the county, only about 75 were black. Many of them lived around Ravenna and worked as unskilled labor. Most white people in the county were against slavery and its expansion. The county also had some ardent abolitionists, especially in the northern townships and in Randolph. John Brown had lived and worked in Franklin Mills. Several towns were active stops on the Underground Railroad. Portage County was very huge on the abolitionist movement. The chief abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison himself came, and the black abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, who would have had the stature of a Martin Luther King, he also came. As strongly as some felt about slavery and abolition, the county was not a bastion of racial liberalism. Treatment of blacks, as throughout the North, was uneven. Blacks received ill treatment from whites, um, not only in Portage County, but throughout the North. They wanted slavery abolished, but uh, the black persons had their place. On the eve of the war, the vast majority of people in Portage County were prepared to fight to save the Union. 
but some were also willing to go to war to destroy slavery. The Federal garrison at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor was a burr under the secessionist saddle in South Carolina. As talk of leaving the Union circulated in the South in early 1861, Abraham Lincoln declared that Fort Sumter would not be evacuated. South Carolina had had enough. Troops began bombing the old fort. The Civil War had begun. In towns north and south, the country rapidly prepared to go to war. The reaction to the outbreak of the war was one of shock. It was, it was almost like a uh, frenzy that, that swept the county. There was a great deal of excitement in Portage County. The citizens were very much in favor of the Union, and they made their voices heard. This was rightly called, from the very beginning, the War of the Rebellion, and that's how people in Portage County saw it. This was a rebellion, and it needed to be put down. Over the next 10 days, scores of men from Portage County enlisted. The call was given out by a prominent citizen or citizens, and they came in droves. Uh, they all, they marched up on a certain day, they got in line, uh, and they declared their age and, and where they lived and what their name was, and they signed up. Unlike later wars, in the Civil War, neighbor went to war with neighbor. An infantry company normally was made up of a hundred men. Most would come from one or two townships or from an adjoining county. Men in a regiment may have known each other since childhood. The Civil War was personal. His company was made up of friends and neighbors, so if he skedaddled or if he even flinched, he'd find it difficult to go back to Portage County again. 20 members of the Ravenna Militia Artillery, a largely ceremonial and highly popular group, headed by Captain Charles Cotter, were the first to enlist. Prior to the war, Cotter's outfit, it was used for, for events like, like July 4th, and, and they would come out early in, in the morning and they'd fire so many guns, and in those days they had the wavy old glass and it would rattle in the, in the windows, which would irritate people, and then at sunset they would fire the guns again. Two other groups came forward about the same time as Cotter's artillery. One was the Franklin Mills Rifles, the other, the Tyler Guards, mostly from Ravenna and Northern Townships. The U.S. War Department gave them new names, formal military designations. The Franklin Mills Rifle Company and the Tyler Guards formed the core of two companies in the 7th Ohio Infantry. Cotter's ceremonial militia artillery became Battery A of the 1st Ohio Light Artillery. The men had signed up for 90 days, but it was not going to be a 90-day war. No one thought that, that the war was going to last as long as it did. It just didn't seem possible. Many more men were going to be needed. Most of the three-month men signed on for three years. Over the ensuing months, more companies were created with strong contingents from Portage County. In June, the 23rd Ohio Infantry. In October, the 6th Ohio Cavalry. In November, James Garfield, president of the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute in Hiram, enrolled 60 students and alumni into Company A of the 42nd Ohio Infantry. And a year later, as even more soldiers were needed, men from Brimfield, Randolph, and Franklin Mills formed the core of two companies of the 104th Ohio Infantry. In all, more than 2,000 men who called Portage County home in 1861 fought in the Civil War. Most enlisted in local companies, but they also joined units throughout Ohio and in at least 20 other states. 
Mm -hmm. they, they were blacksmiths, there were carpenter and joiners, uh, there were wagon builders, there were people that owned shops, uh, there were a lot of farm hands. Men of every walk of life rushed in to be a part of this war. Lawyers put down their law books to join the effort. Farmers put down their plows to join the effort. Men of every stripe. They served primarily in the infantry, but also in the cavalry, artillery, and navy. The vast majority were volunteers. All but a few were white. Most were single and had at least a common school education. Usually you would, you would think in Portage County and elsewhere, you have the stereotypical young peach fuzz face young guy going off the war as a teenager. But that's not so. I think in Portage County, most of the men were in their 20s. And there were some that had young wives and little toddlers that they left behind. The military needed younger men, men who could march 10 miles a day and tolerate bad weather, harsh living conditions, and indigestible food, men who could withstand the psychological roller coaster of war long periods of boredom, punctuated by spurts of utter terror. Of the roughly 2,070 men who served from Portage County, more than 300 died in battle or from disease. For every seven men who marched off to the cheers of friends and family, one did not come home alive. Most Portage County soldiers were quickly exposed to the Southern Pipeline, the route between Northeast Ohio and the fields of action. They took that route headed south, many took that route headed home. Leaving Ravenna, they took the railroad north to one of the camps around Cleveland. When they left to go to Cleveland, there was a huge holiday atmosphere. All the schools were out, the little kids had had signs that, that they would lead the troops down to the train. At the start, the training for the, for the troops that went to Cleveland was very lax. And they would have visitors come in, they'd have picnics and that kind of thing. After a brief period of drilling, often without uniforms or rifles, troops were transported to Camp Denison at Cincinnati. Training became more intense. They spent a lot of time in line of march, deploying in line of battle, moving in various directions to the officers' commands, and then getting back in line and marching some more. And the new soldiers needed all the training they could get. They say that there were more uh, men injured learning to march with the bayonets <laughs> than, there, than there were uh, actually once they got on the battle line. They usually all had a mark somewhere on their back where somebody got too close. There were many of them probably didn't know how to shoot a rifle. And I'm, I'm sure there were many in the 6th Ohio who were more familiar with the tail end of a horse as they pushed the plow rather than, a, than ride one. Cincinnati was the jumping off point. From there, the pipeline into Dixie split and sent Northern Ohio soldiers into parts of the country they may never have heard about. Most of them were funneled into the Western theater of the war in the months to come, they would become acquainted with such places as Shiloh, Lookout Mountain, Vicksburg, and Atlanta. The 6th Ohio Cavalry and the 7th Ohio Infantry were among the few Ohio regiments that would see action in the east. Bull Run, Antietam, Gettysburg, Cold Harbor, and Petersburg. For Portage County soldiers, regardless of where they went, the battlefront was never far away, usually just a boat ride on the Ohio River. The training, the travel, impending battles, homesickness, all provided reasons for soldiers to write about their experiences. Some used long letters. 
other short cryptic diary entries, to explain what they were doing and thinking. Portage County soldiers were no exception. There were some excellent letters, not only on, on the battles, but what was, was camp life? What do for entertainment? What did they think? What did they believe? They talked about the weather, the geography, the people they encountered. They griped about their officers, long marches and bug-infested food. They told of comrades being killed and maimed in horrible ways, yet rarely included the awful details lest they upset family and friends. They misspelled words, ignored punctuation, and offended literary sensibilities. They also wrote compelling passages that would rival the most famous of authors. The letters and diaries of seven young men from Portage County helped tell the stories of their 2,000 comrades. James Rudolph was a 21-year-old farmer in Hiram Township. He enlisted for three years as a private in the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. He kept up a steady correspondence back home with his future wife, Clara Strong. Ebenezer Bissell was a farmer from Manaway. In September of 1861, he had been married for five years and had two children. Emma was born just two months before her father became a private in the 42nd Ohio Infantry. David Bard was a teacher and was teaching school in New Philadelphia. He enlisted in the 7th Ohio, only to get sick and receive a medical discharge, much to his disappointment. Bard spent six weeks recuperating and then enlisted again, this time in the 104th Infantry. Nathaniel Twitchell also came from Brimfield and joined the 7th Ohio. The 18-year-old farmer enlisted for three years, was wounded, got promoted, and then re-enlisted when his three-year tour was over. He would be with Sherman on his march to the sea. In Franklin Mills, Adam Weaver couldn't wait until his 18th birthday to enlist. He lied about his age and joined the 104th Ohio Infantry at the age of 17. He wrote long, detailed letters to his fiancée, Charlotte Morton. It was all done in code, so they could write to each other and tell each other everything that was going on. And uh, at that time, they were, they were checking mail occasionally. They didn't want the soldiers giving away secrets. Before his tour ended, Weaver would find himself on an operating table, imploring a surgeon not to amputate his seriously injured leg. George Gilbert was a 20-year-old blacksmith living in Edinburgh. A spiritual man with a dark sense of humor, he enlisted in the 6th Ohio Cavalry as a farrier, a blacksmith armed with a pistol and a sword. Before his tour was over, he would experience the conflict from a very different perspective as a prisoner of war. Finally, Alpheus Bloomfield, a 22-year-old farmer from Randolph, he joined Battery A of the 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Bloomfield was a caisson driver and would spend four full years fighting the rebels. Of these seven young men, two would not survive the war. Only one would return home without spending time in a hospital for treatment of a wound or a disease. The war opened with great expectations in the North. 90 days, quick military victory and back home. Many young men in the county and throughout the North feared that the war would end before they could enlist and get to fight the Johnny Reb. The Union defeat at Bull Run in July of 1861 shattered those illusions. It was not going to be a short war. It was not going to be a bloodless romantic adventure out of some novel. After only a few months in Western Virginia and Kentucky, David Bard of Brimfield could see that the Southerners would not be easy to defeat. They have a power underrated by us of the North. 
They're not the weak, undisciplined rabble that they were said to be, but a powerful, well-disciplined army. David Bard, 7th Ohio Infantry. In the first two years of the war, few battles went in the North's favor. Sometimes it was hard to tell which side was the winner and which side was the loser. Battles at Shiloh, Second Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg produced no end to the war. Portage County soldiers were at all of those fights. There were also hundreds of them at Gettysburg in 1863. The epic confrontation dominated that year. Two armies, totaling 160,000 men, fought for three brutal days. 50,000 soldiers were killed, wounded, or captured in Lee's unsuccessful thrust into the North. The North was victorious at Gettysburg, but after two years of war, even that stunning Union victory failed to provide an end to what was becoming a very demoralizing conflict. Gettysburg and the earlier battles produced a numbing realization that the bloody affair would drag on. No one knew how long. Those battles also helped generate thousands of letters from soldiers to loved ones back home. Soldiers felt the need to talk about one of the most important events in their lives, the anticipation of their first big battle. Men wondered what would it be like? How would they react? Would they be wounded? or killed. From the time of their enlistment, men thought about those questions. They knew that they were headed off to war, and they knew the consequences of war. They knew that men would be killed and wounded in war, and that fact never escaped them. You must not worry about me, Clara. If I am to be shot, I shall be. But God grant that be not my fate. James Rudolph, 23rd Ohio Infantry. Dear wife, I would write you a few lines, for it may be the last time that I shall have the opportunity to write you. If I get killed, I shall die in a good cause. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio Infantry. And when the moment came, when they experienced that first battle, they wrote about that too. Sometimes with bravado, sometimes with wonderment, but almost always with a sense of relief. Dear sister and brother, I am happy to inform you that I have been in two battles and ain't dead yet. I got two buckshot through my old hat. I don't care how much they shoot my hat so that they don't hit my head. I am confident that I laid two rebels low with that old sword you gave me. George Gilbert, 6th Ohio Cavalry. David Bard was part of the Union victory at Winchester, Virginia. He wrote a female friend in Brimfield, Friend Alice, you doubtless have heard all the details of the battle. I was there. I sent 35 leaden admonitions into the ranks of the enemy. I saw many of our brave boys die. God knows I wish I never behold such a scene again. David Bard, 7th Ohio. James Rudolph of Hiram and the 23rd Regiment had spent the first year of the war in Western Virginia. In the late summer of 1862, they were suddenly sent east to Maryland to help defend against Robert E. Lee's first incursion into northern soil. At Antietam, more men died in a single day of battle than on any other in our military history. Rudolph and the 23rd were in the thick of it for a few hours. Dear Clara, I suppose you have been anxiously looking at the papers expecting to see my name among the wounded, dead, or missing. I am still alive, well, and unharmed. 
Clara, I am not a brave boy by any means. Still, I didn't shrink Sunday when we charged the enemy. Rudolph also thought about being shot at, and in turn, trying to kill other human beings. At such a time, a person forgets the danger, forgets that he is liable any moment to run against a bullet. Your companions drop down around you, and you mind it no more than a falling raindrop. That does not seem natural, but we are not natural. When I drawed up to fire, I knew perfectly well I was shooting at a human being, but I considered I was doing my duty. Adam Weaver of Franklin Mills reacted much the same way and wrote his sweetheart about it. If you ask one of us boys if we delight in killing the rebels, nearly all will say no. But perhaps the same soldier boys under stress of battle, the booming of cannons and the firing of muskets will shoot at anything that is in their front. There is nothing civil about this war but name. Adam Weaver, 104th Ohio Infantry. Civil War battles produced horrible slaughter. New weapon technologies combined with old methods of fighting to kill and injure men in awful ways and in staggering numbers. Soldiers were shocked at the carnage they witnessed. Once they saw the outcome of a battle, that was heart-wrenching for them. The outcome made it real for them. You know, in battle, people die. Alpheus Bloomfield was at Shiloh. The greater portion of the men lay unburied for over five days, and some are not buried yet. Every log house, stable, woodshed, and corn crib was filled with wounded and dead for miles in all directions. The greater portion of the army have moved off the battlefield owing to the bad smell. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Ebenezer Bissell of the 42nd Ohio witnessed a harvest of death in northern Mississippi. We fought three days very hard, and our regiment was in the hardest of the fighting. I tell you, it looked rather hard to see so many of our boys killed, some with their heads shut off, and some with their legs, and some with their arms. I hope I shall never see such a time again as long as I live. Ebenezer Bissell. David Bard was at Winchester, Virginia. The dead and wounded covered the ground. Our hospitals were filled with wounded, and the woods and negro sheds and roadsides strewn with the poor fellows. It was only a small part of the great aggregate of suffering that existed. David Bard, Brimfield. The great aggregate of suffering that Bard observed was leading many Northerners to believe that the war might never end. Civil War soldiers spent only a small portion of their time actually fighting the enemy. They spent more time in camp than they did on marches. They spent more time in camp than they did in battle. They spent a great deal of time in camp. It is very dull times here in camp, and there is nothing going on to pass away time very pleasant. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio. Everything seems very dull in camp. Cannot get newspapers less than five days old, and not very much news when they do come. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Being in camp meant having to find things to do to pass the time. To the soldiers, it would have been very, very monotonous with, with all of the drill, plus the food was bad, and they were probably always worried about whether the next meal was going to be any worse. There were some bright spots. If you had a fiddler or a guitarist, you were truly blessed. Captain Charles Cotter had his men square dance. We're having some music in our battery today. Our boys have two banjos, one flute, and some of the 49th boys are over with a fiddle and banjo. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Some units kept pets as mascots for entertainment and companionship. 
cats, dogs, eagles, chickens. The 104th Infantry had three dogs. The favorite, though, was a bull terrier named Old Harvey. Harvey was wounded twice, but survived the war. There were other forms of diversion in camp, card games, dice, boxing matches, and drinking. And while many an enlisted man and officer indulged in those forms of entertainment, others chose not to be so tempted. We have prayer meetings in our company once a week. I enjoy myself more there than I can at the gambling halls. I haven't played a game of cards nor drank a drink of whiskey since I've been in camp. George Gilbert, 6th Ohio Cavalry. Northern armies camped near southern towns, and soldiers often got to interact with local residents. That did not always work well. The people are almost fools where we have been. They are the most ignorant beings that ever lived. They live more like hogs than anything else. I would not live the way that they do for all of the world. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio, Big Sandy River, Kentucky. Many northern soldiers, including those from Portage County, also encountered southern blacks for the first time. They did not have a high opinion of them. Many of them, of course, maybe for the first time, had seen black people. They found them to be less than white people. They found them to be inferior. They found them to be subservient. Soldiers' letters were filled with stereotypical and racist statements common to many Northerners in the 1860s. David Bard was a thoughtful, educated young man from Brimfield, yet his letters home from Kentucky contain almost casual racial aspersions and language. A group of darkies are enjoying themselves highly, listening to the monotonous thumb-thumb of the banjo occasionally springing up and giving vent to their pent-up passion for music by some ugly contortions of the body they call dancing. A Negro has the very soul of music in him, David Bard. Bard supported emancipation, but he clearly saw blacks as inferior. A Negro insurrection is talked of about here. I think it's impossible. In fact, my opinion of the Negro race has changed materially since coming south. Not my opinion to his rights, but to his capabilities of enjoying those rights when protected by them. The Negro does not possess enough brain to carry on anything like a systematically arranged insurrection. Other soldiers treated blacks with total disrespect, as children to be toyed with. There was one, a nigger wench, came into camp the other night and boys throwed a pan of flour on her head. You ought to have seen her show the white of her eyes. George Gilbert, 6th Ohio Cavalry. Keep in mind that slavery was sectional, but Negrophobia was national. Even though they were in favor of freeing the slaves, they wanted them to remain in the South. Long periods in camp could be a battle against more than just boredom. Ebenezer Bissell of Manaway did not do well spending extended time in camp, exposed to the elements and limited activities. His health suffered. He was homesick for his wife and children, and he showed signs of depression. Dear wife, I have had the rheumatiz and have been so lame I could hardly get around. I am getting tired of living. I cannot say I have seen a well day for the last three months, and I am getting discouraged. I wish I was at home with you. I have got sick of war. Ebenezer Bissell. Bissell had two and a half years left on his three-year enlistment. To be a soldier meant to complain. Complaining allowed you to get things off your chest, relieve some stress, and help pass the time. Army food was at the top of the list of gripes. All that we get is crackers, meat, and coffee. No one knows what hard living is until he has been a soldier in service on the field. 
Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. The main things were the hard tack, which was like a concrete biscuit. Uh, they had rancid pork that they just totally detested. Some of the men put theirs on the bayonet and took it to the mountainsides and gave it a military funeral. Our hard breads and bacon is not fit to eat, for the bacon is full of livestock and the crackers are moldy. It is a shame that our government cannot give the soldier enough to eat that is good. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio. That diet ruined a lot of digestive tracts for a lifetime. If soldiers weren't happy with the food, they were even less pleased with their living conditions in the field. You can imagine there would, there would always be insects, you know, humidity, the weather would always affect you. And, and it was always muddy, so it wasn't very pleasant. Dear sister, it has rained for the past week and snowed in hard wind. If I was at home, I should be putting the cattle in the stable. But the government don't think enough of its soldiers to put them into a stable, nor a pen as good as your hogs have at home. George Gilbert, 6 Ohio Cavalry. And they love to gripe about their officers. I think that McClellan is the greatest general of modern times. To plan, but is not worth a fig to execute. David Bard, 104th Ohio. Our general is a damned fool. His name is Sherman. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio Infantry. In mid-1863, as the war was dragging on, it created hardships for families back home. But those who remained behind, especially the women, pitched in to help the war effort. Portage County's women got actively involved. They had women's aid societies, and they would make up, up supplies for the soldiers to eat, or, or socks, or underwear, or else they, they would send medical supplies. So the people back home got involved in the war also. Women played another important role during the war. Besides taking care of their families, they often had to help operate the family business. When the men were away, then they had to assume other roles. They had to take charge of the small factory or take charge of the farm, take charge of the tannery. The women themselves had to do a lot of the work that the men had left behind. Uh, case in point, my, my great-great-grandmother, who was living in this village of Ravenna at the time, she moved out with her in-laws out on the farm out on Bray Lake Road, and she helped them while her husband was off at war. Men in the field needed support from back home, and they needed assurance that the family farm or business would survive. The women of Portage County and others who stayed behind provided for both. In July 1863, the Union Army had met Robert E. Lee's forces at Gettysburg and sent them back south without the major victory that Lee had desperately wanted. About the same time, Union forces also were trying to cut the Confederacy in half. That meant seizing control of the Mississippi River, and that meant capturing the seemingly impregnable fort at Vicksburg. Ulysses Grant and his top commander, William Tecumseh Sherman, had tried plan after plan to take the city. He had sent his troops against the Vicksburg fortifications with little success and thousands of casualties. We have been to Vicksburg and we got whipped very bad and was glad to get away the best we could. We lost a good many men that might have been with us today if we had a good general. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio Infantry. Eventually, Grant put the city under siege. Union forces moved closer and closer to the southern lines of defense with some surprising results. We are so near the Rebs' work, we can talk with each other and trade canteens and jackknives. Our boys and the Rebs lay down their arms and meet each other halfway, 
and have a good old chat, and then shake hands and go back and go to shooting at each other. Ebenezer Bissell, 42nd Ohio. It wasn't long before Vicksburg fell. On July 4th, 1863, the same day Lee retreated from Gettysburg, the Union gained control of the Mississippi River. Portage County soldiers joined Union troops everywhere in celebrating the twin victories. Lee and his army almost annihilated. The Potomac Army finally, grandly victorious. Vicksburg is ours. Rebs, guns, and everything. Hoorah three times. Hoorah for Grant and Meade and their brave boys. James Rudolph, 23rd Ohio Infantry. You cannot imagine the enthusiasm of the army on the victories. It cures the sick and makes the despondent cheerful. David Bard, Captain, 104th Ohio Infantry. Part of the Union plan was complete. The South had been cut in two. In 1864, the North would start to tighten the belt on the Confederacy. It seems our generals have staked everything in this summer's campaign. Grant is around Richmond, and Sherman has a death grip upon Atlanta. If as we hope and trust both fall, the end of the rebellion has come. David Bard, 104th Ohio. The young Brimfield captain had excellent insight. 1864 would be a pivotal year for the North. By springtime, major offensives were underway in the east and west. In Virginia, Grant attacked Lee with unrelenting fury. He drove the rebel army south until he had Lee penned up at Petersburg near Richmond. For the rest of 1864, Lee's army could not mount a serious offensive. In the Western Theater, hundreds of Portage County men were part of a massive army commanded by Sherman. His object was Atlanta, industrial and emotional core of the Confederacy. In May, Sherman pushed south through Tennessee into northern Georgia, almost daily clashing with southern forces. As in the east, death counts mounted rapidly. Not all of the deaths were caused by enemy fire, however. In the Civil War, for every man killed in battle, two others died from disease or accident. One of those was Vactor Stanford, whose wife and parents lived in Randolph. Stanford was a member of Battery A of the 1st Ohio Light Artillery and had recently re-enlisted for another three years. He became a victim of the war during the Atlanta campaign, but not from enemy fire. He was with Sherman's army in the march on Resaca, Georgia, and he was ramming home a charge in his cannon when it prematurely exploded. The explosion blew off both of his arms and severely burned his face. It took three weeks for the young man to die. Clinging to life, Stanford was taken to a hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee. His commanding officer was kind enough to keep the family informed of Stanford's initial progress and eventually his death, praising the young man and giving comfort to his wife and parents. It was an act of humanity in an inhumane war. Sherman's army labored on toward Atlanta. It took him almost three and a half months and thousands of casualties, but eventually he was camped at its front door. We could see the town of Atlanta from where we was. The night was all quiet and we could see the enemy with their wagon train and artillery and infantry. Nathaniel Twitchell, 7th Ohio. We can see our shells burst in the streets and we can see the citizens hurrying to and fro. Scarcely a night passes, but some of their buildings are burned by our shells. If they do not evacuate soon, their town will be completely destroyed, and a soldier will not be able to get enough boards to make him a bunk. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. On September 1st, the rebels abandoned Atlanta, and Yankee troops marched into the city. I only wish that the whole North could feel the pride and exultation as Sherman's army does and what we've gained. We are as proud as an army has ever existed. David Bard, 104th Ohio. Sherman's army rested in Atlanta. The Ohio general already was hated in the South. 
Over the next few months, he would give Southerners reason to hate him 100-fold. About the time the Atlanta campaign started, soldiers were presented with a unique opportunity, the chance to re-enlist even before their current three-year term ran out. Thousands of them did, including many Portage County men. Each earned a 30-day furlough and a $402 bonus. Others, however, declined. You need not be scared about me re-enlisting. I would not enlist again for all the gold that could be piled up in the old capital. After my time is up, no man can have control over me. George Gilbert, 6th Ohio Cavalry. Two weeks after writing that letter, Gilbert was out getting supplies from a small town in Virginia. He never made it back to camp. He was captured less than a mile from his regiment and sent to Libby Prison in Richmond. After a few months, he received news that he was to be transferred out of that hellhole to a new prison the South had just opened in the spring of 1864. Four months after arriving at the new prison, he was admitted to the hospital. Ten days later, George Gilbert died of scurvy and dysentery at Andersonville, Georgia. By 1864, the nature of the war had changed. The focus became more about black Americans. Within a few months after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation took effect in 1863, the government had created the Bureau of Colored Troops to oversee the recruitment of black men who wanted to enlist. By 1864, there were thousands of them. Three were from Portage County. One was Frederick Arnold, son of a washerwoman in Ravenna. In 1864, he enlisted in the 27th U.S. Colored Troops. He was trained at Camp Delaware on the east bank of the Olentangy River. White troops were trained on the west bank. The two others were former slaves in Virginia, who had escaped and found their way to Portage County. Jonathan Ramsey was 34 and working and living in Franklin Mills when he joined the 25th U.S. Colored Troops. He was trained at an all-black camp William Penn near Philadelphia. Eugene McRice had escaped into northern lines and began tending the horses of Union Major William Stedman, a fervent abolitionist from Randolph. Stedman sent McRice back to Randolph. A short time later, McRice enlisted in the 27th U.S. Colored Regiment. The training was different. Um, whites re uh, received training that prepared them for battle. Blacks did not. Blacks were brought into the army initially not to fight, but for other reasons, to serve as teamsters and cooks and to build fortifications. They were brought in to be personal servants to white officers, but not to fight. And they faced immediate discrimination both from the government and from white soldiers. They initially were paid less than white troops. They were trained and led by white officers, not black, and they received a chilly reception from the white troops, who believed that they could not be taught to fight and would run in the face of danger. Dear Father, you and the rest of the people in the North seem to think that the Negroes, if armed, could do a great deal. There you are mistaken. I believe that our brigade could whip a hundred thousand Negroes. They are a pack of indolent cowards and as ignorant as a stump. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Artillery. Time would prove Bloomfield and others wrong. By the end of the war, more than 200,000 blacks had joined the Union Army and served bravely. More than 5,000 were from Ohio. Two of the three black men from Portage County survived the war. Jonathan Ramsey returned to Franklin Mills after doing mostly garrison duty with the 25th U.S. Colored. 
Eugene McRice was seriously injured in 1864 at the gruesome Battle of the Crater during the Siege of Petersburg. He was hit in the leg, and his right arm was shattered by a mini-ball. He spent the rest of his enlistment in a Union military hospital. Frederick Arnold of Ravenna survived the debacle at the crater, but became ill a few months later in North Carolina. He died of a lung infection in early 1865. His mother could not afford to have his body shipped home. There is a marker for him in a Ravenna cemetery, but it's unclear today where he's buried. Many of the black men had gone to war not only to preserve the Union, but hopefully to win freedom for their enslaved brethren and to also win civil and political rights for themselves and their race. That was probably one of the more depressing aspects of the war for black soldiers. They had fought, died, and they returned home, and they found just the opposite. Matilda Morris was a wife and mother of two living in Randolph. She was active in the local relief society, but she wanted to do more. Matilda wanted to be a nurse. My friends would not listen to my plan, saying there was work enough to do at home. In spite of this, I could not feel that making shirts, bandages, and other things was all I ought to do. Matilda Morris, Randolph, Ohio. She finagled an appointment through the governor's office. In the summer of 1862, she left her children with her parents, got on the train at Atwater Station, and headed for Washington, D.C. to work as a nurse. Morris was not alone in offering her time and energy to the war effort. Others from Portage County also served. Like all of them, Morris witnessed the horrors of war and tried to ease the suffering of soldiers. She first worked at Armory Square Hospital in Washington, D.C. During her time there, she met Abraham Lincoln when he visited the wounded soldiers. He would go down one side of the ward and up the other, shaking hands with everyone and speaking a kind word. He would shake hands with me, ask me about my work in my home, and charge me to be good to his boys. I have often seen the tears roll down his careworn cheeks while he was talking with some wounded soldier. Matilda Morris, nurse. Morris also volunteered to go into the field to work, a dangerous assignment. She ended up in a field near Winchester, Virginia, at a place generously called a hospital. Sheridan Hospital was composed entirely of tents, some so low that we had to stoop to enter but they were all full of badly wounded men. Here the men lay on the bare ground with knapsacks, boots, or anything for a pillow that would raise the head. I saw things that made me sick at heart. Matilda Morris served as a nurse for almost three years. Like other such volunteers, she brought immeasurable aid and comfort to wounded and sick soldiers. Franklin, Tennessee was a town of just 900 residents south of Nashville and had seen little fighting. In late 1864, a savage five-hour battle there would change all of that and have a profound effect on Portage County soldiers. Sherman had taken Atlanta and was preparing to plow eastward through Georgia to capture Savannah on the Atlantic coast. However, Confederate General John Bell Hood wanted to make Sherman change his plans, so he decided to try to force Sherman to head in the opposite direction. Hood and his 25,000 veterans made a dash northward to threaten Nashville, Tennessee. He hoped Sherman would follow. Sherman, however, didn't take the bait. He split his army, sending 35,000 men to beat Hood to Nashville and keeping another 60,000 for the march through Georgia. 
the race to Nashville was on. Throughout November, the two armies nipped at each other as they headed north toward the decisive battle at Nashville. On November 30th, however, Hood caught up with the Union Army at Franklin, one day's hard march south of Nashville. Northern troops had reached Franklin a few hours ahead of Hood and had time to dig in. Some 35,000 Union soldiers were in strong defensive positions by midday. Then they waited. Hood's army stretched out across the horizon, two miles away, clearly visible across gently sloping fields. Northern soldiers grew tense, waiting for the battle they knew was at hand. 3.30 p.m. I have a near-perfect view of the rebels forming their lines. Their regiments are in view, stretching through and across the fields as far as the eye can see. Adam Weaver. He knows that the rebels are on their way and everybody's waiting and it's very quiet and he doesn't know if he's going to survive. David Bard, a captain in the 104th Ohio, walked among his men that afternoon, talking with them, calming them, and checking their position in the middle of the Federal lines. I heard Captain Bard say, Do you think the Lord will be with us today? Silently, I said a prayer. Some of the boys shook hands with the captain. Adam Weaver, 104th Ohio Infantry. Despite the lack of cover, despite there being only an hour of daylight left, Hood had ordered a dangerous all-out frontal attack against superior forces well protected. At 4 p.m. on that warm golden afternoon, wave after wave of gray-clad rebels swept across the fields toward Union lines. Adam Weaver lay behind the breastworks, his rifle pointed at the mass of men moving quickly toward him. The rebel boys were ordered to advance and were led upon a death as certain and sure to be met with. We begin to fire without orders. The poorest marksmen hit the vast human target. The first wave of southern troops smashed into the northern lines and were brutally struck down. A second line threw itself against the Union defenses only to be met with a savage fire. Each time they hammered into the Union lines, they were met with withering volleys of musketry and artillery. Then for an instant, they sliced through the center of the Union line. The enemy got the works in the center and held them for a few minutes. Some of the men in the battery killed the rebels with their picks and axes. Some threw stones at them. I never saw such reckless charging in my life. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. The assaults, the hand-to-hand -hand death struggles, and the killing continued long past sundown. And then, suddenly, it was over. Adam Weaver was ordered to go out into the night to look for northern wounded. He was not prepared for what he discovered. I find ghastly heaps of dead and dying rebels everywhere. The piteous cries and moans of the poor boys are enough to turn the heart to stone. Wounded boys creeping to the rear, their screams, their curses all around me. Some crying for water, some praying their last prayers, some trying to whisper to a friend or to me their last farewell message. The air seemed to close and the smell of blood was everywhere. Adam Weaver. The Battle of Franklin has been called the Pickett's Charge, the Gettysburg of the West. The savagery rivaled that at Shiloh and Antietam. The South lost more than 6,000 men, including 15 generals, in five hours. The Confederacy's major army in the West was severely crippled. Portage County had a major stake in the Battle of Franklin. Local soldiers from four regiments found it their fate to be at that town on that day. Some played larger roles than others. Some saw glory. Others suffered anguish. Among the four were the 104th Infantry and the 1st Ohio Light Artillery, 
both filled with men from Brimfield, Franklin Mills, and Randolph. The 104th Ohio was at the center of the strongest point of the rebel charge. They were among the units that bore the brunt of the rebel assaults. Battery A was positioned behind the 104th and poured shot and shell on the enemy as they charged again and again. When the Union line was breached, they fought with bare fists, knives, and shovels. Within a few days after the battle, Battery A was rewarded for its service there and elsewhere during the war. It was pulled off the front lines and placed on reserve status. There was good fortune and honor for other Portage County men coming out of the Battle of Franklin. During the intense pitched fight in the center of the line, two soldiers from the 104th braved enemy fire to capture Southern battle flags. Newton Hall of Brimfield and John Ricksecker of Aurora won medals of honor for their actions. But Franklin was not all about glory and good fortune. My dearest Charlotte, I have very distressing news. Our beloved captain, David Bard, was mortally wounded, shot, and could not be moved. He was left in rebel hands on the battlefield. God rest his soul. Adam Weaver, 104th Ohio. Bard was shot as he stood in the battle line with his company sometime during one of the South's furious charges. Barely clinging to life, he became a prisoner and eventually a casualty of war. A family from Franklin took him into their house where he died a few days later. The war was over for the young school teacher from Brimfield. In mid-November 1864, a week after Lincoln's re-election, the rest of Sherman's army left Atlanta on its march to the sea. His 60,000 men cut a swath 60 miles wide on the 250-mile march. Even before they had left Atlanta, his troops lived off the land foraging for what they needed, and sometimes for things they didn't. We are allowed to take anything that is outside of the house. We get nearly all of our meat from the country. The truth is that we are taking nearly everything that can be eaten by men or animals. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Artillery. Sherman's goal was to capture Savannah and destroy anything of value to the Confederacy along the way. His army moved relentlessly through the heart of Georgia. Nathaniel Twitchell of Brimfield was with Sherman's army. He had re-enlisted in the 7th Ohio in early 1864. November the 20th, 1864. Marched all day and killed some stags for supper. Burnt the steam tannery and captured some rebel stores. November 21st. Marched about 15 miles and burnt a cotton gin, etc. December 5th. Marched all day and went out foraging. Got some hogs and potatoes. Nathaniel Twitchell, Diary, 1864. Sherman's troops faithfully obeyed their orders to move quickly, forage, and destroy anything of value to the Confederacy. They left in their wake burned public buildings, bridges, and cotton mills. Railroads were prime targets. Rails were torn up, heated, and bent around trees. Soldiers called them Sherman neckties. In early December, Sherman took Savannah. It was his Christmas present to Abraham Lincoln. By that Christmas of 1864, the war had seriously shifted in the North's favor. The main rebel army in the West had been destroyed. In the East, Grant had a hammerlock on Lee's army at Petersburg. 
A few months later, as the dogwoods began to blossom in Northern Virginia, four years of bloodshed came to an end. In early April, 1865, Lee tried one more military strike, lost, and surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. Soldiers from Portage County, the 6th Ohio Cavalry, were there when Lee met Grant. News spread quickly via telegraph about the fall of Richmond and the end of the war. Alpheus Bloomfield of the 1st Ohio Light Artillery was in Tennessee doing routine guard duty. We fired a salute of 200 rounds in honor of General Grant's victory and for the downfall of the flower of the rebel army. Alpheus Bloomfield. Matilda Morris, the nurse from Randolph, was back in Washington when the news came through. This caused great rejoicing, which was deepened when the news of the capitulation of the rebel army was flashed over the wires. The next night we went up to the White House to hear the president speak. I shall never forget how his face lit up with joy. Matilda Morris, nurse, Washington, D.C. The joy was short-lived. On Good Friday, Abraham Lincoln was shot and died early the next morning, April 15th. So a week later, the president was dead. And the mood went from one of euphoria to great, great sadness. The whole county was in mourning, deep mourning. It didn't matter whether you were a Democrat or Republican. This great president had died. Again, the telegraph spread the word to every hamlet. In Franklin Mills, Charlotte Morton went into town to get information. The square in Kent was called then the Bricks. And that's where the communications were. Uh, that's where they got their news and stuff. The wildest excitement prevails. The posting board had the following. Abraham Lincoln died this morning at 22 minutes after seven o'clock. An unlooked for and terrible calamity has befallen my beloved country. We need to pray for our country as never before. Charlotte Morton, Diary. Soldiers, thousands still in the South, were stunned. The sensation was great in Nashville. The day had been set apart for celebration, but when they received the news, they changed their celebrating to mourning. Alpheus Bloomfield, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. The Mighty Fallen. Abraham Lincoln, the noblest of martyrs to a noble cause. While I was at Armory Hospital, he visited it several times, and how the boys would rally if we told them Uncle Abraham was coming. Matilda Morris, nurse, Washington, D.C. Ravenna and other Portage County towns had been decorated for celebrations. The gay banners hoisted in celebration at the fall of General Lee's armies have been replaced by black banners and flags flown at half-staff. Bells toll continuously, a few of the citizens, with sad and dejected faces, are wandering about the lonely streets. Charlotte Morton, Franklin Mills. In Nashville, Alpheus Bloomfield wrote home, expressing a common thought among soldiers. I am in hopes that the assassinators will be caught and receive what they shall justly deserve. That is, a hanging. Alpheus Bloomfield, Nashville, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Bloomfield got his wish. In July 1865, after a quick military trial, four conspirators were hanged. One of them, 42-year-old Mary Surratt, was the first woman executed by the federal government. Even as the war and fighting had been winding down, it was not a case of soldiers just waiting around to head home. Fighting was still going on. Adam Weaver of Kent learned that hard lesson. After the Battle of Franklin, his 104th Regiment had been moved to North Carolina. While crossing a swamp to engage a rebel force, Weaver suffered a serious gunshot wound. He was shot in the thigh. 
and there was, it was, there was a lot of water in there. He would have drowned if it hadn't been for his uh, cousin that grabbed a hold of him, pulled him out of the water, tried to drag him to a place where he would be safe. The doctor said, we have got to take that leg off or you're going to get gangrene. He said, no, 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 please, please, just give me a few hours. And they did. And so they didn't take, have to take the leg off. Weaver limped the rest of his life, but he had his leg. As somber as the mood was after Lincoln's death, the country went about the business of trying to recover from four traumatic years. When Johnny comes marching home, First there was the matter of paying tribute hurrah, to the soldiers who had fought to end the rebellion. Welcome, then, hurrah, By late hurrah, spring of 1865, Sherman's army had completed its long march up the east coast to Washington. A grand review through the streets of the capital celebrated the Union victory and the bravery of the veterans. Brimfield's Nathaniel Twitchell scribbled his usual understated note in his diary on May 24th. Marched into Washington to a grand review of the Army and saw any amount of people from all parts of the U.S. The next step was to disband the Citizen Soldier Army almost as quickly as it had been put together four years earlier. One by one, the Portage County companies were mustered out. The 7th had seen hard duty. It had traveled from West Virginia to Pennsylvania to Virginia to Tennessee and to Georgia. Just a few weeks after Gettysburg, it was sent to New York City to help maintain peace in the wake of ugly draft riots there. The men who re-enlisted and became part of the 5th Ohio marched across Georgia and up the coast to Washington. Nathaniel Twitchell and the regiment weren't put on railroad cards for the ride to Ohio until late July of 1865. Twitchell got back to the family farm in Brimfield on August the 6th. The last entry in his diary was brief. Got home today from the Army. Nathaniel Twitchell, Brimfield, Ohio. On its trek home, the battery left Tennessee for Louisville, Kentucky. From there, it followed a familiar path backward. Cincinnati to Columbus to Cleveland, and finally back to Ravenna. The circle was complete. The pipeline to the south was closed. Men were glad to get home. Sketches and paintings, however, romanticized the reunions. 
For some, readjusting to civilian life could be hard. Injuries lingered throughout men's lives, and all the injuries were not physical. Surprisingly, most of the Portage County men who came back readjusted pretty well and went back to their old jobs. Now, who's to say whether they didn't have the cold sweats at night or bad nightmares? In later wars, terms such as battle fatigue and post-traumatic stress would be used. Some Civil War veterans suffered from what was called nostalgia, or soldier's heart. They missed their comrades, and some could not forget horrible things that they had seen and done in the name of saving the Union. One of the big changes, as I see it, is that they were among all this noise and all of this activity for three or four years. And now all of a sudden they come home and it's dead quiet. And they're left with their thoughts of what they had done and their doubts for the future. In May 1949, a national magazine published photographs of 68 surviving Civil War veterans, 68 out of some 3 million men who had served North and South. One of the 68 was from Atwater in Portage County. John Great was 103 years old in 1949, the last surviving veteran from Portage County. He was born in Edinburgh Township, and in 1863, at the age of 18, he enlisted in the 6th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. During his two years of service, he fought with Grant in the wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Petersburg. After the war, Great got married, moved to Atwater, and had a long and successful career as a woodworker, buggy maker, and farmer. He was active in local, state, and national veterans organizations even after he turned 100. He became the epitome of the honorable uh, citizen soldier that fought. John Great died in June of 1949, one week after the magazine was published and two months shy of his 104th birthday. A year later, a memorial was erected in Atwater Cemetery to remember John Great and other Ohio veterans of the Civil War. The monument joined a number of others already erected by citizens throughout the county. In November 1865, scarcely seven months after Appomattox, citizens in Nelson Township dedicated a beautiful four-tier monument to the war and more than 100 local men who served. The next year, Wyndham, which had also sent more than 100 men to war, including 17 who died, built a monument on the village green. In 1870, Deerfield dedicated a monument to the men who served that community. Over the years, other communities added memorials. At Restland Cemetery in Brimfield Township, a monument to Civil War veterans was built in 1909. In Kent, the Women's Relief Organization dedicated a memorial in 1928 to men and women who served as soldiers, physicians, and nurses. I believe that they wanted to show that this was, an, this was an effort. This was an effort by the community to stop the rebellion. It was successful, and that monument is a tribute to their joint effort. Remembering the war was, and is, important. 
Soldiers did it through annual reunions and organizations such as the Grand Army of the Republic. We do it today through reenactments, roundtables, patriotic organizations. The impact of the war on people's lives and its political and social legacies are compelling reasons for keeping its memory alive. And while the large public monuments are important, there are other smaller and more poignant markers that carry even greater meaning. Headstones in cemeteries from Manaway to Randolph, from Kent to Edinburgh, mark the graves of Portage County veterans. They may have served three months or three years. They may have gone to war to save the Union or free the slaves. It makes little difference. What is important is that they served their country and their county in a time of peril. 150 years ago, they answered the nation's call. They became the soldier boys of Portage County.